Hello and welcome to Huts the Huskies second Dog Science Explained video. This video is going to look at the scientific evidence around dominance in dogs. So first up, what is dominance in dogs? Now the correct definition of dominance, the scientific definition, refers to a relationship between two individuals over one specific resource. But this is not how you'll hear it referred to in the media or by trainers. So I'm going to take the explanation of dominance used by trainers. Uh, so this is dominance in terms of the pack. The idea being that all dogs want to form and maintain a strict linear hierarchy of command. And at the top of this is the dominant dog or the alpha dog. And the idea is that if you're not asserting dominance over your dog, your dog will try and dominate you because in a dog's world, you're either a follower or a leader. So first, let's look at why people think dogs show social dominance, or, or you could say the evidence for dominance in dogs. The idea of dominance in dogs is based on comparative zoology, which is attempting to understand one species by the behaviour of a closely related species. So for dogs, what this means is using wolf behaviour to help us understand dog behaviour and its motivations. Dogs and wolves are closely related. They share 99.6% of the DNA, and genetic studies have shown that, at least on the paternal side, grey wolves are the only ancestor of our domestic dog. They clearly show some similarities in anatomy, physiology, and behavioural patterns. Now, the first studies of wolf behaviour were conducted by Zimmern and Mech in 1975, and they used captive wolves. Um, by the way, all the names of all the research articles I've used are listed below in the description, if you want to read any of them. Anyway, what Zimmern and Mech observed was that these captive packs were aggressively run hierarchies. They had a distinct alpha, and the scientists observed frequent battles over this alpha position. In addition, the lower members would constantly show appeasement behaviours to the dominant members to show that they meant no harm and to avoid attack. And basically what was drawn from this was that a wolf pack was a linear hierarchy with an alpha male and female which controlled the activities of the group. So you can see how from this, using comparative zoology, the idea that you need to teach your dog his place, that you are the alpha so he will accept your leadership and listen to you, has occurred. The next thing we're going to talk about is whether it's fair to expect a dog to behave like a wolf. Or you could say, is it fair to expect a wolf to behave like a dog? But funnily enough, no one does. So, is it fair to call dogs wolves? Although dogs and wolves obviously share some behaviours, there are lots that they don't share. So, wolves will breed with one mate until either they die or that mate dies, whereas dogs are highly promiscuous. Also, two packs of unrelated wolves will almost always fight if they meet, whereas groups of dogs from different homes usually greet and play happily. So let's think about that so often quoted figure of 99.6% shared DNA between a dog and a wolf. Another example of a close genetic relationship is the bonobo and the chimp. They too share 99.6% of DNA, so exactly the same amount as the dog shares with, with the wolf. These two species are clearly similar, they share the same basic anatomy, physiology, and again, certain behavioural patterns. But, chimps live in groups centred around groups of males, they are omnivores, and they will hunt and eat small monkeys. Uh, they also show high levels of aggression, and they will kill members of other chimp groups. Bonobos, on the other hand, live in groups centred on females, they are rarely aggressive, and they've never been seen to murder in the wild. Uh, the point here is that just because two species share DNA, it does not follow that they would share a social system. And, I'm, of course, all of you know, you share most of your DNA with that chimp. And you, or I hope you don't, behave anything like a chimp. Um, you also share 25% of your DNA with mice, daffodils and your dog. And you don't share 25% of your behaviour with them. Basically, my point is that the amount of shared DNA doesn't really say anything about behavioural sim similarities. Tiny changes in DNA can cause huge changes in behaviour. The brain is actually 25% smaller in a dog than in a wolf with the same body weight. 
And scientists believe this is because, unlike the wolf, dogs don't have to hunt for food, defend themselves, or do many of the complex behaviours that wolves perform to stay alive. So the real question is whether dogs show the complex behaviour of forming packs and relationships the same way that wolves do, or have they lost this behaviour? So do dog packs pack? The obvious place to look for packing behaviour in the dog is in groups of freely interacting feral or sanctuary dogs. And here the evidence gets a little complicated. On one hand, nine studies of feral dog behaviour have found no evidence of any kind of social structure, let alone dominance hierarchy. The most they ever found were temporary associations. And unlike wolves, there was no breeding pair. All females bred, and there was virtually no pair bonding, paternal or other dog care apart from the mother, which are all characteristics of the wolf pack. However, there are three studies that have found dominance hierarchies in dogs. They found what's called formal dominance. This means they were able to build a hierarchy based on signalling behaviours. So if you take the classic low posture greeting, they found that most of the time dog A greeted dog B like this and dog B greeted dog C like this, but very rarely did it go the other way. They also found that the most aggressive dogs got preferential access to resources. However, this formal signalling hierarchy wasn't related to the level of aggression or resource access. Now, the behaviours classed as dominant signal and submissive signal were not justified in these papers, and it has been argued that they didn't really test if dominance existed. For example, they classed avoidance of eye contact and retreat as submissive signals with no justification for why these showed submission. And if you've ever done a behavioural study, you'll know that this sort of thing is open to interpretation. For example, how do you tell the difference between a dog that's simply looking at something else and a dog that's avoiding eye contact? Also, the higher levels of aggression which led to the food access can be explained in terms of asserting dominance, but can also be explained another way. A study by Bradshaw found that dogs living in a sanctuary didn't show a dominance hierarchy, and actually access to resources was decided in terms of preference or need. So one animal always got first pick of toys, he could take toys off the other dogs, but a different dog had first access to food. So she would give up toys, but other dogs gave up food to her. And again, a different dog would be the first to approach people. And this wasn't always stable. Sometimes the dog who usually had access to toys would give them up to another dog, and the same with food. What seems to happen is the dog who wants the resource the most gets it. And dogs learn who values what and when in order to avoid fights. So instead of the feral dogs responding to aggression by giving up the food being labelled as submission, they had simply learnt that it wasn't worth arguing, so to speak, with that particular dog over food. And these studies also found some bi-directional signalling, e.g. dog A submissively greets dog B, but then later on dog B submissively greets dog A, which leads us on to our next point. Next we're going to talk about how wolves behave, or basically how reliable those early studies of captive wolf packs were. Modern studies of wolf behaviour completely contradict the old studies. The most referenced source of research comes from Mech 1999, but there are countless others. Mech observed wild wolf packs for 13 years and found that the typical wolf pack is actually a family, with the adult parents guiding the activities of the group in a cooperative system. So the status of alpha is not something which is won either by aggression or by strength, but it's just the result of breeding and raising a litter. This litter then stays on voluntarily to help raise the next litter, and the pack is formed. Now, this litter is in no way forced to stay and help. They can and do, in some cases, leave at any time. All studies of wild packs have shown no instances of younger wolves challenging parents and attempting to take over. Indeed, if a parent dies, an unrelated member is often recruited, so the so-called beta doesn't take over. There were also no dominance or status contests observed among the younger wolves. Um, The only thing that has been seen in wild wolves is this so-called formal signals of dominance and submission. 
And what scientists have found is, although primarily these are performed by the younger wolves to the breeding pair, a lot of these so-called submissive behaviours are also performed by the parents, formerly called the alpha, to the other wolves. And these actions are never forced or the result of conflict. They're always voluntary and they're usually associated with the reunion. So scientists now think that these formally labelled submissive and dominance behaviours are actually signals of greeting and social bonding. It's now thought that the original aggression-maintained linear dominance hierarchy observed in the early captive studies was a result of extreme stress and unnatural structure. So these packs were created from random, unrelated individuals. Now, to understand why this is important, you need to understand one of the main reasons that pack behaviour evolves. Now, logically, if one individual, instead of breeding, helped another to breed, we'd expect that behaviour to die out because the helper would pass on fewer genes. But, because you're just as related to your siblings as you are to your offspring, by 50%, if you help raise three siblings your helper genes are just as likely to be present in the next generation as if you raised three of your own children. So this packing behaviour and all the behaviours that maintain harmony have evolved to work only between relatives and therefore may not work between unrelated individuals, particularly completely unfamiliar individuals. The next thing to think about is dispersal. In Mech's study, he observed that wolves would reach one to three years old around the time that they sexually mature, and then disperse. But in captivity, you're fenced in, and wolves who naturally would have left can't. And this, again, causes a lot of stress. And stress, as you'll know if you have any knowledge of animal behaviour, can lead to abnormal behaviour. And this is what the dominance seen in captive wolves is now thought to be. Another thing to think about is, if submissive behaviour is designed to prevent conflict the idea that it's evolved so that everyone knew their place and could get along without fighting, why doesn't it work? Captive wolves will attack each other even following a display of submission, and so will wolves from different packs in the wild. Now, it can be argued that this doesn't mean wolves, and therefore dogs, don't show social dominance, just that it's a mechanism for coping with extreme conditions in periods of high competition. However, If dominance hierarchies in wolves have an environmental cause and not a genetic one, this then couldn't be passed down to the domestic dog. And even if it's a genetic behaviour triggered by environmental factors, the domestic dog should not be subjected to such extreme stress. And if they are, then as a responsible dog owner, you would be obliged to deal with the underlying problem, not just the symptom of dominance behaviour. Likewise, some studies which concluded there was no dominance in free-ranging dogs, have been criticised for using sanctuary dogs, which are well provisioned with food and other resources, and also either in same-sex groups or neutered, meaning there's no competition for mates. By which they mean that dogs might have to compete to have first choice, but no dog is going to go without. Now, this critique has been responded to with the arguments that A. Pet dogs should always be well provisioned, and B. You as a human will never directly compete with your dog for mates. Now the last thing we're going to do is look at some specific examples of dominance training techniques and see if the assumptions behind them hold true. Uh, But we're not going to look at if they're effective or not because that will be the topic of our next Dog Science Explained video. So first up is the always eat before your dog rule. Now this is based on the assumption that an alpha remembering that this term is now viewed as obsolete by scientists, will always eat first. However, studies on natural wolf packs find that this is only true when the one particular kill is very small. When the kill is big enough, all pack members will eat together. So in terms of your dog, he always gets enough to eat. And it's never the case that if he eats, you will go without, or vice versa. So this rule really doesn't make sense. And also in wolf packs, if food is scarce, the cubs will always eat first. So the cubs, in terms of the old pack model, would be the lowest members. Next, let's look at the always have your dog walk behind you and always go through doorways first rule. This is based on the incorrect belief that the alpha always goes first. But actually, in wolf packs, although the the parents may decide where the pack goes, 
Any individual can be upfront and leading at any time. And also, there are no doorways in nature. So I don't know where the doorway part came from. Perhaps from some of the old studies of captive packs where there are gateways in the enclosures. But I couldn't find this anywhere in the literature, so I'm pretty sure this is just made up. Also, this rule doesn't account for service dogs, guide dogs, hearing dogs, police dogs, or for sled dogs, um, who are supposed to pull ahead, and they still obey commands. And if they thought they were dominant, why would they obey those commands? And finally, the alpha roll. So this is rolling the dog onto his back and holding him there, um, and this is usually suggested as a punishment for undesirable behaviour. This stems from the idea that the Alpha will roll other pack members onto their backs to assert his dominance. However, in actual fact, wolves are never forced to do this. What actually happens is they will roll over voluntarily for their parents, the Alpha, and this is thought to be a relic behaviour, akin to the way they would roll over as cubs to have their bellies licked in order to stimulate urination. And this is never a response to aggression or pushy behaviour. Basically what that means is it's not used as a method for the alpha to control or discipline the pack. And as I mentioned before, occasionally these kind of behaviours are bi-directional. So again, the assumptions behind this technique aren't true. And one point I'd like to make is that this rolling behaviour in dogs is usually seen in the context of play. So if you watched last week's video, you'd have noticed that Hutzer will roll his friend Oscar over while they're playing, but he will then voluntarily roll over for Oscar, who isn't strong enough to roll him over. So my point is, if Hutzer was asserting his dominance over Oscar, why would he then give a submissive display to him? So, dominance in the domestic dog, bad habit or useful construct. Let's recap the evidence. So first... Dogs are descended from wolves, and they share most of their DNA, as well as some of their physiology and behaviour. But, other DNA comparisons show this is no reason to presume they share a social system. Second, the majority of studies show that free-ranging and feral dogs don't form packs or show dominance, but this is inconclusive as a few studies contradict this. Third, the wolf pack model, so often portrayed by the media and by dominance trainers, does not reflect the true dynamics of the cooperative family group that we now know makes up wild wolf packs. Fourth, the assumptions behind dominance training techniques are usually either incorrect or not supported by evidence. So, uh, let me know what you think. What conclusion would you draw from this evidence? Uh, Maybe you know of some other scientific studies on this topic which I haven't discussed. If so, uh, please share. I'd love to read them. And finally, if you have a a question, if you have a look at your dog and you think, why does he do that? Let me know and I'll see if I can answer it for you in a subsequent video. So well done for making it to the end. I'm sorry it was quite a long video and thanks for watching.